Hi, my name is Ryan Languish and this is Luda Lodge, a channel about sparking growth for game designers. And today I'm gonna to be doing another mechanism spotlight for the video game Slay the Spire. Slay the Spire is a game that combines two, di two different popular kind of genres. One from board gaming, which is the genre of deck building games, where you're customizing a deck but not before the game, it actually is during the play of the game, and a big part of these types of games is kind of how do you efficiently upgrade and change this deck while you're actively using it in the game. And combining that with a popular video game pattern, which is a roguelike, which tends to kind of follow the pattern of each time you play, you're gonna do a run where you start from scratch and you're going to be going through the game and customizing and, and having the game getting more difficult. But if you ever die in that game, that's the end of your run. And if you would want to play again, you would start from the beginning. And so in Slay the Spire, you essentially start at the beginning with your character's deck simply being 10 cards that are standard for that for the character that you're playing. But as you go through each of these rooms, which kind of follow something that looks like maybe a, a Final Fantasy or other turn-based kind of RPG style um, combat systems where you're just gonna kind of have a turn-based combat with whatever enemy in that room. Um, after each of those rooms, you typically have the opportunity to upgrade your deck with, usually it'll give you like the option of, here's three cards, pick one of them to add to your deck. Um, and so as you're going through all these different rooms, you're, you're customizing, trying to figure out what cards might combo well together. How can I build um, a deck that's going to you know, be, be effective as the game gets more difficult? And it layers on top of that um, additional things such as these relics that are kind of active all the time outside of your deck and, and have other effects that may interact with cards in your deck or other just effects in the game. Um, and that kind of further kind of defines your run. Every run feels a little different as you as you get further into it. Um, but a big piece of it, the, the main portion, is really that deck building piece that if you have ever played games like Dominion or Thunderstone or a lot of, I mean, deck building is, is a huge um, genre in the, in the modern board gaming scene, um, it'll feel very familiar um, in that sense. But what I want to talk about in this video is how because Slay the Spire is a video game, what it's able to do that simply wouldn't be possible in a physical game or simply would be very uh, impractical or annoying to implement um, in a physical game. And I think there's some really cool things that um, it kind of leans into that, that ability. Because video games are very good at uh, doing complex calculations, right? Things behind the scenes. I mean, if you think of games like some of these really complicated civilization or games that have all this simulation happening in the background, that works in a video game because the video game is doing all the heavy lifting. You can think of, and, and this, I think we see this in some modern games where we try to um, pull in some of this, these concepts that we see in video games and bring that experience to the physical table. And it can be very challenging because suddenly all those, that simulation piece that was handled by the video game now has to be handled by the players, right? In kind of like an upkeep phase or something where they have to manage that state of the game that otherwise would be just happening in the background and the players don't have to worry about it. Um, and so I actually wanna go through some specific card examples in Slay the Spire that I think exemplify how it leverages um, that identity as a video game to do some really cool things. Um, so the first one I have here is Perfected Strike which says deal six additional or six damage, but deal two additional damage for every card in your deck that has the word strike in it. Now this is cool because if you were playing a physical game, you could do this, but it would be very annoying to know how many how many cards do I have that have the word strike? Do I check that before you know each each round? Um, do I go through and count them when I play this card? It's not really practical to implement. Whereas in Slay of the Spire, when this card comes in your hand, it just auto calculates the value. It just tells you this is how much damage this is gonna do because it knows how many cards are in your deck. Kind of a similar concept um, with Rampage here, which deals eight damage, but then it says increases cards damage by five this combat, which a combat's just a round against a group of enemies. Um, and so just like a game like Dominion, you can cycle your deck and likely will cycle your deck um, within a round in Slay of the Spire. And so this card, if you play it and then later it shuffles from your discard pile back into your deck and you get it again, 
it's now going to be stronger than it was before, and it's going to keep getting stronger. And this would be difficult to implement in a physical game, you know, like we've seen in legacy games, stickering things, or or there's um, the closest maybe we've seen is a game like Mystic Veil that uses transparent cards to kind of be able to build custom cards together. But here it's able to be done very seamlessly because the game in the background can just keep track of how much it's been upgraded within a combat. Streamline um, is, is very similar, but instead of dealing with the damage upgrading, it's kind of the cost that's upgrading. So it starts costing two, but each time that you play it, it's gonna become cheaper to the point where it could be a free card, which in, in this game, you know, 15 damage at no cost is a very efficient um, action to be, to, to, to be using. Um, Blizzard is kind of a cool one. Um, it's specifically with the, the character that has this mechanic around channeling orbs. So it's kind of um, these orbs that are channeled at any point in time and they kind of cycle and trigger different effects. Um, and Blizzard basically is going to deal damage based on how many frost orbs you've channeled during that combat. And so you could, you know, ideally get a build where maybe you're doing a lot of frost um, generation and then this card is getting really strong the longer that, that that combat goes on. And again, that's just tracked, you know, the card comes to your hand, it's just going to tell you how much damage it's going to do. You don't have to do anything as the player to do those calculations, um, which I think is what really separates it from maybe what a physical game experience would be like. Sands of Time is another kind of neat one where um, most time, most uh, turns in Slay the Spire, you have to discard all your hands at the end of your turn, unless a card has the retain keyword, in which case you can choose to hold on to it. And so Sands of Time, basically, the longer that you hold on to it, it's going to keep getting cheaper and cheaper to play to the point where 20 damage for only, you know, one or two, two, two to zero cost is, is a really powerful um, action. And this would be something that's hard to track physically if you were holding it in your hand. Do you have to remember how many turns you've held it? Is there other, some other way um, of tracking it? Um, so it's kind of, kind of a cool effect that's able to be um, implemented here. There's also a few cards um, similar to this one, which is Discovery, that says choose one of three random cards and add it into your hand, and it costs zero um, this term. And the exhaust keyword simply means that this is then removed um, from your deck for the round, so you don't cycle this card. You know, this could be implemented if you had like a reserve of cards that you're gonna, you know, randomly draw three and add one to your deck, but then at the end of the round, you'd have to know that, that you have to take that card out. You don't get to keep it in your deck permanently, um, but it works just really smoothly in this Bar and kind of injects an interesting decision. You know, there's already a lot of interesting decisions in the combat, but it, it injects one of those interesting decisions of card selection within a combat. I have to decide which of these three cards that it shows me is best for me, you know, right now in this particular combat, in this particular situation. The last three cards I want to talk about actually um, kind of go beyond a single combat. All the ones I've talked about so far upgrade or change cost or do things within one combat. These other three start getting closer to what we are familiar in, in board gaming as like legacy concepts, which are kind of these more permanent upgrades, or at least that's maybe the closest comparison. So the first one I have here is Genetic Algorithm, which is gain one block, which for a cost of one is a terrible card. <laughs> like that, that's not, a, that's not good value. But you permanently increase the amount of block on this card by two. And then it exhausts for that combat, so you're not gonna get it again that time. But in the next combat, now it's gonna be a block three. And so you can imagine if you can get this early in a run, you know, a run of Slay the Spire, you end up having many, many rooms that you go through. There's, there's kind of three acts that you're gonna go through a map of all these different rooms. You could potentially get to the end of the run having this card for just one being a super efficient blocking card for you simply because you've kind of invested in it over time. And that's a really cool kind of layer on top of what you're already doing with the, the deck building and the customization. Um, so I think that's pretty neat. Um, this one's kind of cool, a lesson learned. It's, it's a cost of two to do 10 damage, which isn't really very good, but it says if it's fatal, you get to upgrade a random card in your deck. So fatal simply means it was the killing blow. It finished off an enemy. And so if you can manage to time it that you, you know, are finishing enemies with this, a random card in your deck gets upgraded, which I guess is another concept I haven't mentioned, which is that every card in Slay the Spire has an upgraded version of the card that's just 
the same card but better, which I think is actually another good example of, of something that's possible because it's a video game. Like, like in a physical game, to do an upgrade of a card, you'd probably have to have a separate card that is the upgraded version and you'd have to swap them out. And that's just a little bit more fiddly than what's possible here. And so I, I had a really fun run with this one where I was basically, because I got it so early in the run, by the end of the run, I had a deck where all my cards were upgraded, basically. So it, it was a very kind of efficient and strong deck, mostly because of the way I utilized this card um, throughout, uh, throughout the game. And even at times delayed a battle when I could finish the kill because I'm like, well, if I can draw a lesson learned, then I could use that to finish it and, and upgrade, um, which is kind of kind of a cool concept. Um, and similarly, in the last one I have here is Ritual Dagger, um, which deals 15 damage, but if it's fatal, it actually increases the damage of this card. So it's a little similar to some of those ones we saw before, but again, you're specifically trying to get it where it could be a fatal blow so that this card can permanently get stronger and stronger um, to the point where, um, you know, it's it's a much stronger card than you would expect for the cost of one, even with, with the exhaust keyword. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think uh, it's cool to see that, I mean, it's so clear w where a lot of the inspiration of Slay the Spire comes from if you're coming from a, a board gaming background. But I, I was very um, kind of, the designer side of me kind of kind of liked all these little things, finding them that were like, oh yeah, this is something you could not really have done um, in a physical deck building game. And because most of the examples we've seen of deck building games have been physical, Slay the Spire really kind of explores this new territory and there really are kind of new strategies and new experiences that come out of that. So I would definitely say if you um, enjoy deck building games um, in board gaming, you'll probably love Slay the Spire. Um, I know I'm late to the party, like, <laughs> Slay the Spire is very popular and I, I just started playing it recently um, and have enjoyed my time with it. Um, but yeah, some interesting thoughts that came to mind when I was playing it that I just wanted to kind of talk about. Hopefully you found them interesting as well. If you liked this video, um, give it a thumbs up below, subscribe to the ch channel for more content like this, and I will see you in the next video.